Welcome, welcome, welcome back to another Leverage Addict podcast. I'm your host, Blandon, and today we have an extraordinary guest who's mastered the art of leveraging income diversity. We're going to be diving into this remarkable journey of Jetan Pabu, who's sitting across me today, who's transitioned from backpacking across 55 countries to a successful entrepreneurship career. With multiple small and medium businesses, and he's a property investor himself, managing over five properties, he has a CFO background and is a man of faith. Jetan's story is going to be both inspiring and enlightening. So I'd just like to welcome you, Jetan. Thanks, Planet, for having me. <laughs> That's awesome. We are very happy to have you on board today. So I thought maybe to get to know you a little bit, maybe you can share a bit about your transition from, you know, the backpacking thing, right? And you're just like, you know, traveling all over the place and then you went to uh, do your corporate thing and then you climbed the ladder and eventually you left that and then jump into entrepreneurship. What were the pivotal moments? Because there's, there's obviously a lot going on in there. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, just a shout out to Morg JHQ. You guys are one of the reasons I am where I am today. So thank you, Blandon, as well for oh, you, too much, everything you've done too much. in my career. It's really appreciated. So why did I pivot into small business and uh, entrepreneurship? Quite simple, really. Uh, one was I got to a point in my corporate life where, you know, you get to that all the politics and all the egos and all the dramas and all the stresses. And I said, hey, you know what? I can do better than this, you know, and I want to keep making other people rich. I wanted to do something for myself where I can provide not just for myself, but for my family and for others. And we can talk a bit more about that later. But the other reason was um, uh, because I just simply always had this passion about creating wealth and passive income. And, you know, you see a lot of stuff on YouTube, uh, people tra- sitting on the beach and sipping cocktails in Bali and things like that. But that's not the reality. Really? Passive income. <laughs> I wish it was. <laughs> what about the Lamborghini? Uh, no, not anymore. I sold that last year. No, just jokes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, I wanted to grow passive income. So it gave me freedom of choice. And that's really simple. And I think everyone would like, love that in their life. Do you start an e-commerce store? Uh, no. <laughs> Amazon FPT? Uh, no, no. FPT. FPU. No, F-E-U. I don't, <laughs> don't even know what it is, but uh, yeah, you always see that on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, <laughs> sure. Basically, I pivoted out of corporate life. It actually started in 2016. I, I bought my, my first property. About a year after that, I actually bought uh, my first business, which was a physio clinic. Now, I have no idea anything about physio. I'm, I've never done anything in healthcare before. And I was working full time at the time. So yes, I was leveraging my six figure salary in corporate into these investments and was able to build it. And within the space of uh, two, two years, I was able to sort of almost double the revenue of that business. It's a big leap though. Like, so how did you go from like, okay, I'm going to buy my first property and then going straight into buying like this thing that's not even related to what you're doing. Yeah, it actually was quite a random experience in to be honest, I was actually getting treated for an injury at, at the at the physio clinic, which wow. I bought for a knee injury. I used to play lots of football and uh, the physio at the time told me he was selling his business. And we just basically got into discussion about about it. And I knew in anything in healthcare in New Zealand um, being funded by ACC uh, would be a, a good cash flow, cash cow, I should say. So yeah, that's how that, that conversation really started. Right. And so you just started t- talking to your physio yeah, and then you were like, right. hey, I'll buy into your business. Did you buy the whole thing? Or yes, great. Yeah, because he was retiring. And oh, so really? he was looking to exit. And I thought it could be a great opportunity to look into and see where we could go. How did you come to that decision? Because obviously it's a complete different industry from what you're doing. Yeah. <sighs> To get to be honest, I think it was uh, like I said, I just finished my backpacking adventures, and I was in this in this in a corporate environment, really good salary, but I always knew that wasn't going to be enough. Like I always knew that in the end of the day, I'll always be relying on on a job to sustain me, and I wanted something else that would actually give me an extra layer of income, so I could actually use that cash flow to recycle into other investments. <laughs> With the decision to buy the physio, what was the methodology? Like what made you confident? Obviously, uh, being I'm a chartered accountant and um, uh, I did some, obviously my due diligence, I looked at the numbers and the figures, we made sure that everything lined up correctly. It actually took about one year to buy it, to be honest with you. There was lots of back and forth, things that were kind of not uh, as transparent as I wanted them to be. So I always sort of had to make sure that I investigated certain things and certain issues before putting my, my name to paper. But yeah, it, it took a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I guess if we just go back to the beginning, because you mentioned like now you own multiple businesses, you've got properties and healthcare and fitness, like you've got the CFO background, but how did you trans, like it's a, it's a big transition to, to buying business because like a a lot of people cannot fathom. Yeah. I I think the way I just explain it is that your risk appetite and I always ask people when they, when they invest in something to know what your risk appetite is or your risk profile. I I guess at the time when I was in my uh, late 
20s, I had a high risk profile. And that probably comes from my background of traveling, backpacking, exploring different countries, yeah. buying one way flights and traveling by land and exploring and getting lost in really random places. So for me, it wasn't necessarily, I saw it as a huge risk, but I did see the opportunity. <laughs> so let's, let's look at this uh, first physio business that you looked at, right? Because the owner was retiring. How did you sort of manage the risk of like, you know, this guy's got all the relationship with the, sure. the his clients. Also, you're not working in a business. How do you make sure that, you know, you can make this business yeah. run smoothly without you knowing the actual craft? That's a great question, actually. The first thing I, I realized that the, this, the clinic was situated in, in Otahu, which is a lower socioeconomic environment, and it was actually free at the time. There was no surcharge, and a lot of clinics actually have a surcharge. So part of that gave me the confidence that people also come in there from a pricing perspective. And so while there was a really great physios, and no doubt there was a great team there, there were a lot of people also coming there because they were receiving a great service with uh, basically a great, with no with no costs. And at the time, um, the, the team that was there had already been there for about two or three years, so that the physio sold to me, he had an established team there. So I wasn't buying a clinic where the owner was had all the leverage with the patients and he had all the ins and outs. He had his own patient uh, list, but there was already an established team, which I bought as part of the practice. Okay. And so when you made the decision around how you're going to run it, maybe walk us through a, uh, that a little bit, because I do know clients who like thought about buying some sort of business you know, as a, a secondary income, because cash flow is going to be better than properties, but obviously there's a higher risk. But there is some, I guess, knowledge that they can transfer into that business. Whereas in your situation, you're purely in your position, you're basically looking at using your accounting knowledge. Correct. Yeah. And um, there was there were a lot of teething issues and lots of things that after I bought it that I found out, for example, there was a shortage of physios in New Zealand. And so the retention was a real problem to retain physios and to hire. And I didn't know anybody of that when I bought it. And so I realized after the, the sale, the, the settlement, that I actually had to create systems to keep people, one, engaged into the clinic and actually to make my life easier because I'm still working full time at the time doing a 40 hour job was to create uh, systems where all the reporting mechanisms, uh, all the KPIs, all the uh, financial data would be streamlined. So I would just get the end product really so that I can just, you know, analyze and look at reports and then make decisions based on that. So the first thing in the first year was establishing systems. And at the time I bought it, there was absolutely no systems. And that's where a bit of my accounting knowledge comes in or finance knowledge because I'm from a corporate background. It's all about systems and processes. So I actually established systems and the systems that allow me to tell me how the business was actually performing, not just financially, but internally. That's so good. So essentially, when you picked us up, you saw like the value add that you can do, Correct. which was having a more structured process around how reporting is done. And then that allows you to make better decisions. One of the biggest struggles, right? Like people buy these businesses is like they said, it's very hard to find good people. How did you you manage that or that, that challenge in yeah. itself? Yeah, I've definitely had my fair share of good and bad apples. One of the things I realized very quickly was that to retain staff, I had to do things differently. So one of the things I did was we built a, a really great uh, training program for graduates. And that program became so good for their training that we were referred to other graduates. And that became a, a funneling system of bringing people in. So often our graduates would refer other graduates to us even after they left. And that just told me about the relationship and the value they have from their training. And on the management level, I realized I had to bring in a really good uh, manager that could actually oversee everything because um, one, I couldn't be there all the time. But two, you need someone on site who you can trust and believe in and help them grow as well. So one of the things I invested into a really good manager or clinical director, I should say at the time in the physio clinic, and she was able to oversee that almost entire structure. And together working with each other, we were able to build processes and structures to make the clinic really efficient. <laughs> That's so awesome to hear. So in a previous conversation, we also talked talked about your leverage model and that is sort of the crux of what you believe to be your success in yeah. terms of buying businesses and, and running them. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. I often, when I speak about leverage, I speak about a triangle. And in that triangle, there's yourself on the top with your skills and knowledge. And then there's your relationships on one corner and your finance on the other corner. And all these uh, all these three points intersect with each other at different times. And the way I explain um, how it's applied to myself is that, for example, I'm an accountant, my skills are in finance, uh, that my skills are in um, business, my skills in numbers, but um, I may not have the the skills in, say, for example, digital marketing or um, uh, basically at the time even with, with understanding how banks work and lending and finance structures and things like that. And, the, and so I had to make sure that I had to leverage the right people at the right time to help me in the areas that I was weak in. And that in terms provided me the cash flow then to leverage to put, invest into 
properties or businesses. So for example, Blandon, um, this is why I really honor you because a couple of years ago, um, um, when I needed finance to um, invest into one of our, into, into the gym we purchased, uh, you had told me that at a time after, during COVID that the, the banks had raised their deposit rates on rental properties 80%. And it was through that discussion, you advised me to top up on my, uh, on, on my, on, on my BNZ lending and repaid down my Westpac, um, sorry, and paid, paid down some of my Westpac lending. And it was after that event, I was able to create a, about a $400,000 overdraft facility based on that one strategy. And that gave me a pool of cash flow that I could just use to invest into really anything. Now, that only happened because of my relationship with you. I had no idea that I could do that. It was not something I even planned. But it was that simple discussion with you. And you actually got involved. You actually contacted BNZ for me. And that's why I give so much respect to Mark JHQ because you guys really care about your clients. Oh, thank you, Jason. You know, we're just doing our job. Yeah, you didn't even get a commission for that one. It was just purely out of wanting yeah. to help a brother. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's cool. And I'm glad to hear that worked out for you. You know, you're able to use that capital to invest in further businesses. So I thought maybe we can talk about property investing because that is actually a scenario significant part to your wealth building strategy. Obviously, now you're more focused, your cash flow is going to be from your businesses. But maybe you can offer some of your insights in, term of, in terms of property investing and why did you decide to go into it? Sort of like, how does it fit in the whole thing? Yeah, sure. Oh, For me, property investing is a good way to hold your cash flow. So, so someone like me who's got multiple income streams, which is about seven or actually eight of them, you need a place to hold your cash. Now, interest rates are not that high or weren't that high in the past. So you need a place to plug it. So for me, property was a great asset to, to tuck in all the cash flow into something that is actually growing on the side as well. And so for me, that's why properties became very important because it was a place to store wealth through cash. <laughs> that's great. So... Why is it not like shares? Why is it not like crypto or like other things? Yeah, sure. I actually did invest in a bit of shares, but for me, property was the best. One is a stable asset. Two is a growing asset in New Zealand. And uh, three is because I always thought about generations, you know, something I can actually pass to my to my child or to, to our children one day. <laughs> That's really good. You talked about this seven passive income, like the audience going to be very curious. So would you walk us through that? Is it something that you can share? Yeah. So for me, within our streams of income, there's there are different passive streams and non-passive streams. So there's our consulting business, which is really focused on wealth creation, accounting, finance, marketing, and sales. And then we have our own private client, private clients. And I've also engaged to sit on boards as a finance director and we hold contracts for those. And those are really great because they provide nice stable income and we have nice long-term contracts. Then there's our the, the gym, which we purchased about two years ago. And that's been a, a challenging investment with obviously COVID and lockdowns and lots of the fitness industry have been facing issues. But that's still been a great investment because it's provided a different type of income to the other types of income we have because it's a completely different market. Then we have the, the physio clinic, uh, which is in the healthcare industry, stable industry. You see it's always increasing their rates and it's a cash cow. It's just constantly having, uh, it's, a, it's a high needs area. Physio is a high needs area. There's always someone injured. There's always someone needs help. And then we had our uh, investment prop portfolio of houses. At one point, there were five properties <laughs> and obviously you get your rental incomes. Then we had our shares. <laughs> yeah, that's really awesome. That's great to hear. One thing that you always on the tip of your tongue is, is your faith. Right. It plays a central role in your life and your business. How has your Christian faith sort of influenced your decision making, the values that you sort of live by or the way you conduct business? Sure. Uh, to be honest, my Christian value drives everything I do. The business world can be constantly uh, full with dealing with dishonesty, lies, deceit, egos. And that's quite challenging uh, for someone like me because I have my own ego. <laughs> As a Christian, this means I have to treat people with love and respect no matter how much they've hurt me. And I've been hurt a lot. Easier said than done, obviously. Outside business, I'm a Christian evangelist. So you'll find me on the streets of the city, speaking to people about faith and truth. Truth for me is hugely fundamental as if we make up our own truth, then everyone can say whatever I believe is true. But then how do we come back to a point of what is really true? So for me, I've had to do a lot of stuff around staffing, around issues around our investments have been treated with our staff in some ways because they work in the businesses. And there's been thousands and thousands of dollars of lost income at times because of mismanagement or or not basically fulfilling their, their roles or their obligations. And despite all of this, I still have to show them love and respect and care. And that's not easy when we're dealing with money. But I've always said that money comes and goes, but my faith will always remain the same. So that's how I've sort of had to angle or navigate my Christian faith with the challenges of business. It's not easy, but it is uh, something that I, I hold on to because it's my it's my guiding uh, my guiding post. <laughs> that's good. That's good. What, what are some important values in the Christian faith that you would say that would drive your decision making? So like you say, love, respect, 
effect are there more to it? Like how do you actually apply in a scenario where you're about to fire somebody? Yeah, so that actually happened last week <laughs> with one of my staff within the 90-day period. And and the way I had to go about that was to sit down with the person and actually say, be honest with them and not come in there in a way to harm them emotionally or physically, obviously, but to really sit down and help them understand what's happened, why I've come to the decision and make sure they know that they're supported. Because at the end of the day, when these things happen, it's all, you know, the world says, just get rid of somebody. Whereas what I'm doing is saying, look, I have to let this go, but I'm here to support you after you leave. So if you need some counseling, you need some help. In fact, this person I let go, then I did, she needs some money to go down to Wellington to see her family, something emergency happened. And I still gave her the money, even though she had cost me a lot of money in terms of my business and issue she had caused. I still gave her the money because I could see there was a genuine need. And that wasn't easy. I mean, I make it sound like it's easy just to give someone money. And that's not the hard part. The hard part is when someone's hurt you and disappointed you, it's still giving. And that's what being a fall of Christ is about. It's like giving when even when someone doesn't deserve it, because that's what Christ did for us. He died on the cross for us, even though we didn't deserve it for us. That's so good. I don't know if our, all our audience will uh, be receptive to it, but we'll let it play. <laughs> giving back to, you know, there's a core part of your mission. Like you talk about giving your time back, you trying to donate to a different organization. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how you use your wealth um, to support charities. You, you talk about locally, abroad, what drives your commitment here? Yeah, so my wife and I, shout out to my wife, love it to bits, and my son Josiah, we, we love, love helping people, especially ministries that are involved in helping people. And obviously we we love to support Christian ministries because we believe in the, the truth of what they what they bring to people's lives. And so we're quite big on, on supporting ministries that are actually really impactful in terms of bringing our, our faith into people's lives. And one of the verses that really sticks with me, if you don't mind me reading it, is from 2 Corinthians 9, 9. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should be give what you have decided in your heart to give not reluctantly, under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So for me, giving is an honor to God as he has given me so much. He's given his son to die for me on the cross. How much more than should we give? Last night, my wife and I saw this doco about woman trafficking and it just broke my heart seeing these young girls being abused and sexually abused. And I just saw that and I said to my wife, how can we help in this area? And so we just decided, hey, look, let's just focus on something new that we could do. And because we've got these income streams and passive income streams, yes, I've been facing challenges like everyone else, but we can still sort of look at for room where we can provide for somebody else and not just focus on ourselves and what we need. And so that was really amazing for me. And on top of we we sponsor quite a few children. We've got five kids around the world that we're sponsoring and many other things. So it's a real blessing to bless others. Summary. That's awesome. So as my final question, I want to ask you, Jetan, what advice would you offer to other listeners who aspire to follow a similar path, you know, owning properties, getting into entrepreneurship, buying small businesses and managing them? What are some key takeaways you would give them? The first one is have a purpose beyond yourself and your family. This helps us develop a humbleness and avoids the temptation of greed. And that's really important because often when we pursue wealth creation, it's normally it's for ourselves, right? And of course, we want things that bless us and bless our family. But sometimes that create greed because we're after a certain value in our mind or a certain return. And I think it's important to have a purpose outside yourself. So no matter what happens, you know you're doing something good with it. Uh, the second thing is regularly review your risk in your businesses or your portfolios. I do this almost on a monthly basis now because things are always moving. And that's hugely important to me in terms of my wealth creation strategies because it allows me to understand do I need to make something to pivot into a different area? Do I keep? Do I hold? Do I sell? Thirdly, have your own KPI targets and regularly review them, as I just said. And the last one I say, be open and genuine with people and opportunities will come. For example, the physio clinic, that was simply through being open and being honest with my physio and telling him where I'm at. That's how that opportunity came. For example, you, Blandon, through our discussions about life, faith, and treating each other with respect, that's how that opportunity came where you, you gave me advice to help me with, you know, with, with that investment decision, with that refinancing. And all those happen because the way we treat people, you know, we don't just treat people well because we're kind sometimes. We treat them be well because, you know, we have to love people. And I'm very big on that. <laughs> just having it integrated yeah. in your life, essentially. I really appreciate that, Jaden. Thank you for your sharing and giving us your remarkable journey. And I'm sure for a lot of listeners today, they will find something, some gold nuggets in there where they can apply in their lives. And so for the other listeners out there, stay tuned for more incredible stories and strategies around leverage. And I'll see you guys next time. And again, we want to thank you, Jaden. Appreciate being here. Until next time, listeners. Thank you, guys.